What's up, it's Rowan here from Art of Smart Education with another weekly HSC economic stats update. In this episode, we're looking at labor force data, new unemployment data, how to make sense of it. We're also gonna look at wage price index data that's come out, i.e. wage growth. And we're gonna look at what both productivity growth and the rate of inflation say about the inflationary impacts of this wage growth, but also its impact on real wages. And finally, we're going to analyze, is this an issue or not, and should the RBA be concerned? If this is your first time dialing in, every week I summarize the key headlines from around the domestic and global economy, giving you the key stats and analysis that you need to upgrade your short answers and essays in the HSC Economics course to unlock that band six result. So let's dive right in today. Now, the labor force data has just come out, and regardless of whether or not you look at trends or seasonally adjusted terms, it's increased to 4.2%. So we see an upward trajectory. It was 4, it's 4.1, now it's 4.2%. Now, this is obviously relevant from a position of the RBA's contractionary monetary policy. They've highlighted they've got a dual objective now post the, the RBA review, not just for inflation targeting, but also maintaining full employment. They've highlighted, though, that at the end of the day, and this was a feature of last week's episode, that uh, in the inflation target remains the priority because that's their big concern, but they are trying to juggle and walk that tightrope of how do they get inflation into the target zone but also have minimal impact. The key is minimal impact on the rate of unemployment. Now, what we can see, though, is a trend where that unemployment rate is starting to tick up and that contractionary monetary policy is starting to bite. Now, a reason that we can also understand maybe why this is the case is that the participation rate has increased to 67.1%. When that happens, generally you get people that were hidden that now start actively looking for work. When they start actively looking for work, unless there is sufficient economic growth to absorb all of those newly unemployed, because ultimately when they become actively looking for work, they move from hidden unemployed to actually unemployed. So unless there's enough economic growth to absorb them, i.e. new jobs and new roles that are being created, they end up in the short term when you get a growth in participation causing an increase in the rate of unemployment. And we can see that happen here, where the participation rate has edged upwards, and as a result, okay, the unemployment rate has also edged upwards as well, simply because the level of economic growth has not been sufficient to you know, absorb this increase in the participation rate, and so they've moved into the unemployment category. Now, a couple of other little things we can highlight here. Underemployment rate uh, decreased um, you know, on, on seasonally adjusted terms to 6.3, but it's remained the same at 6.4% if we look at trend, okay? Um, and uh, although ultimately, right, seasonally adjusted is gonna be the more accurate longer term view, so we wanna pay attention to that fundamentally, okay? And what we can also see here, okay, is that youth unemployment is also remaining at 9.7%. But if we take a really quick sort of look at the overall unemployment rate, as we can see, it is heading upwards, right? It's hit a low uh, of 3.5%, right? Uh, in December 2022, right, and June 2023, and it is now moving upwards to 4.2. So we're definitely seeing that upward trajectory. Now, at the same time, we've also seen some wage price index data come through. Now, this is ultimately looking at the, the, the cost of wages um, you know, to, to businesses and firms, but certainly as well for individuals, it's looking at whether or not they're getting pay rises. And this is really important given the erosion of real wages that has been occurring over the last three years due to inflationary pressures. As inflation increases, if wage growth doesn't keep up with inflation, you get an erosion of the purchasing power of a person's income, right? therefore impacting all of those cost of living pressures. So this is really relevant from a perspective of looking at how has wage growth maybe been supporting right, um, you know, uh, households with cost of living. Um, and this also goes into the relevancy around you know, what the budget's doing, around trying to support cost of living, as well as you know, fair work changes that come through every year with the minimum wage to increase minimum wages to try to deal with some of this erosion of cost of living, uh, of you know, wages, I should say. So there's a couple of places you can utilize this. Now, a couple of things we've got to look at. First of all, what's happening over the last year is uh, wage prices greater than inflation. Because if that's the case, what we've got is a positive situation where real wages are improving, not eroding. And we can see that. So first of all, seasonally adjusted, we saw 0.8% this quarter and 4.1% over the year. Now note, this is at a point that is now, uh, you know, it was 4.2, so that was a high, and that was the highest it's reached so far in December 23. And that's arguably been from a lot of analysis and forecasts that, that's sort of the high point. Um, the suggestions are it's going to go backwards from there, right? But it stayed relatively strong at 4.1. Now you can see that that hasn't been that high 
really since March 09, okay? So that's, you know, GFC, you know, just early before the GFC, right? And it's almost 15 years ago. So we can see that we're at periods that we haven't seen for 15 years, which is really quite remarkable and a real positive. Now, if we go and look at the CPI for a moment, this is the recent data as well, over the 12 months to this quarter, we can see that CPI rose 3.8% where we know that, as we said, wage price, right, over the same period, right, reference period June 2024, was 4.1. So in other words, really positive news here is that we can see that wages have, have outstripped inflation, i.e., therefore, real wages have not gone backwards, they've moved forward. Now, they've only moved forward marginally, 3.8, 4.1, so 0.3% real wages have gone forward, but that's still a positive from the point of view that, hey, getting inflation down, RBA, thank you, right, is supporting real wages, right? And then equally, okay, government decisions, whether or not it's through, you know, increasing the minimum wage, right? Also, therefore, supporting improved wages, which is at least helping wages go forward, not go backwards, even if they're going backward, you know, only, only going forward a tiny bit. Now, note, you know, this is still in a context where the prior two years, overall, uh, you know, wage growth uh, was outstripped by inflationary pressure, right? And we can sort of see, you know, okay, during this period here, wage growth has been all sort of sub 3% until we really got up to December 2022. And if we go and have a look at inflation, okay, you know, we can see that, okay, great, like, you know, inflation was sitting over this same period well over the 3% mark, right? So we can see, unfortunately, right, over the period of really the COVID period, 20 to, you know, 23, arguably even, we've seen real wages get eroded. And so while there's some positive news here, it is really very, very small. Now, on the flip side, we should consider the extent to though which this wage growth could cause inflationary pressures. And the way we consider that is we look at labor productivity, because if wage growth is greater than labor productivity, you get cost push inflationary pressure because the cost of producing the goods to a firm is increasing and they pass that cost on to the consumers in the broader economy. Now, we don't have current data, but we do have an RBA forecast, okay? Um, and this is in the Fair Work uh, documentation around their uh, data around labour productivity. Um, and what you can see here is that the RBA's forecast annual growth, uh, you know, to the June quarter, i.e. for the same reference period we've been looking at, to be 3%, okay? So in other words, if the wage price is 4.1 and productivity growth has been forecast at 3%, we've got a gap, right? And that gap is not a good gap because it indicates it will create some inflationary pressure from a cost push perspective because the cost of labor and the cost of producing goods is increasing. Now, again, right, what this highlights is not wage growth to come down, right, because clearly inflation is high. So if you can get inflation lower, okay, really clearly the, the erosion of real wages will not be as, 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 as much of an issue. In fact, you won't need as much wage growth to then keep households ahead of uh, you know, inflation, and therefore you need less labour productivity to also prevent cost push. So you can see why the RBA really views inflation as such a critical lever they need to pull downwards. Now, there's a lot going on this week, so this video is a little longer, because Ross Gittins has also had a fantastic article this week looking at, great, well, is all of this a concern, right, for the RBA in their monetary policy considerations? And in particular, what about inflationary expectations? Because that's the real concern the RBA has. They're concerned that if inflation stays out of the bracket, and that's something we looked at last week in the fact the RBA has highlighted that they're now concerned, okay, that underlying inflation they're not going to really see get under the 3% until late 2025, which is way longer than they want it to. And the longer that sits, the more likely inflationary expectations sit in, which make it harder to get inflation down at all. Okay, And so ultimately, one of the, the concerns here okay, is that, okay, if it stays too high, we all get used to it and it can create inflationary spirals. And one of the spirals is a wage price inflationary spiral. Okay which is that we start acting on expectations and workers and unions therefore demand higher wages, obviously to offset the erosion in their real wages as well, right? And then we see this exact issue that I've just highlighted where if productivity growth is not as great as the wage price, we get employers passing that cost on to you know, individuals through the cost of goods. And so we get wages passing costs on into the economy cost push driving more inflation, which drives more wage growth, which drives more inflation, we get into that nasty wage price inflationary spiral, okay? Now note, um, this has been something that did arguably occur in the 1970s in Australia, and so the argument is, well, is that still a risk now, okay? 
And um, what is identified is that, look, uh, circumstances now are very, very different, okay, which means it's possible to sustain steady wage growth without initiating that wage price spiral. There are three reasons why it is argued, okay? The first, okay, is that because there's greater flexibility in giving people that are underemployed more work, okay, so part-time workers, right, and drawing more people into the job market, there's less upward pressure on wage growth, firstly, okay? Secondly, okay, um, you know, they argue that changes in the institutional environment since the 70s mean that there's less of this indexation idea, right? That, you know, okay, if we've got a, you know, if inflation's going up, wages must go up, but also that, um, you know, everyone, if they got to work, they got a pay rise, everyone else must get the same pay rise. There's a realisation that that doesn't really play out. And the final argument that they have is that, well, the proportion of members you know, in a union is much lower. And so the likelihood of, you know, large union driven sort of increases is also going to not happen. And so therefore, the argument is, you know, well, look, the only way that we get sort of, you know, government sort of changes is through the minimum wage. And that only happens once a year as well. Okay. And so therefore, we've got some differences in how our system is set up. Now, in saying that, it still doesn't account for the reality that you might get some, some cost push inflation because wage, wage growth is greater than ultimately productivity. I think that's going to be a reality, but it's more that that itself may not cause future ongoing big increases in wages that cause us to fall into a wage price inflationary spiral. So there we have it. Slightly longer episode this week. Lots of data that's come out um, and some, I think, really great stuff that you can use in your analysis, particularly around labor market and inflation. All the best for those of you that are still undertaking your trials and see you next week.